Hello and welcome to another video. So again, this is another part of my series where I'm taking a look at previous games that I've worked on, looking at the design of them, also the technical implementation, where I'll be sharing specifics of how different parts worked, or why they were done in a certain way, I'll be making some of that code available, and also talk about things that I would do differently with the project if I was working on it again. So let's dive on in. So the game this time round is a bit of a change from the previous one, which was a very bright, happy, uh, chill one where you're, you're admittedly in detention, but you're solving math problems uh, to this was my first attempt at a horror game. I'm really sort of diving into that. Uh, now with this, you might notice I'm running on a very old version of Unity. Uh, this was the version that was uh, I last used that it was updated in. Uh, I did try and actually run this in the most recent versions, and unlike the uh, Cat Maths game, this one I was getting, uh, and quite unusually actually, a immediate hard crash on playing the game uh, and it seemed to be related to drawing the editor UI uh, which is quite odd. There were some extra add-ons in that that I've got in this that I did remove but that still didn't actually sort it so I've gone and uh, the easiest option was going back to the old version of Unity. Uh, so I will dig into that at some point because I would like to figure out why it wasn't working. So quite intentionally how the game starts off, you're on this environment, uh, on, the, on this planet in this environment that looks very warm, very friendly. You know, you have this nice sort of view out over really intentionally a very picturesque environment. That was the goal to have it looking super pretty. You have this clear indicator that either this beacon thing here is charging and that you have this time remaining. So it seems straight off, you know, immediately, okay, well, we're just going to chill here for 14, 15 minutes. And it's possibly a little hard to tell at this point, but time of day is actually shifting at this particular point. So if we head over to where we can see shadows, might be able to see that a little bit more easily, that there is a slow change. You can kind of start to see a bit of a lengthening out of those shadows. So quite intentionally, the, the time is sort of changing there. And if you wait there, uh, it ends very badly. And there was a couple of things with this. So this path here, this was an interesting one because so, yeah, art, uh, is not my area of expertise. Level design is not my area of expertise. So you crafting sort of this environment, I did heavily make use of uh, the Gaia tools for that, and that did make it a lot easier. But getting a path through this that felt realistic was a bit of a challenge. So what I actually did was, while I am not here, an artist or a level designer, uh, I did, you know, I am someone who's, who has <laughs> wandered around in the world a fair bit. Uh, so what I did was I actually, without this path in there, moved throughout the world because I put basically giant magenta pillars of where I knew that I needed to go. And so I moved, you know, basically as if you know, I was in that world of where felt the most logical area to head. And I recorded all of those points and then set up so I was able to draw those in the editor, which made life a lot easier. So here you encounter your first light globe pickup and your first sort of data pad. So kind of cluing you in intentionally along the path that there are things that you can interact with. So yeah, drawing out this path by having the actual uh, setup there in terms of here's a set of points and painting it, that actually worked a lot better. Uh, I was able to easily clear away grass and it meant that it was an interesting path because it is a fairly empty environment. Again, this was one I was creating under the constraints of building it in under 24 hours, as in, to again, total time, not the actual uh, amount of time 
uh, elapsed from start to finish, but the actual hours spent. And you notice it starts to really get quite dark and it's very difficult to spot the path. It's very easy to get lost, which is intentional. Uh, and getting lost in this is very bad. And that's why we have these light globes, which when activate that, get this cool little hovering light globe above us. But there's a reason we have a counter here of the number remaining and key to press to use them because we do have a very limited amount and these lights do expire after a time. And one of the big things that I did with this and I recommend just the game's free, so you can check it out for free. I've put a link in the description. One of the things that I really wanted to do with this was make a heavy, heavy, heavy use of audio. So the soundscape in the daytime versus nighttime is quite different. Night is intentionally a much sort of scarier sound. Uh, and it's also, there are various moments that can cause it to be a lot more intense sounding. And so quite intentionally, we, so we spotted this light off in the distance. So there's a lot of things where, you know, along the path, you'll find these data pads. Uh, that's something where my interact box for those was something I wasn't super happy with. Uh, definitely needed a bit of improvement there. But the other thing that I'll find is, and again, this was an intentional thing. So it knows where that path is. And I didn't just use that for uh, being able to actually give feedback there in terms of where you should be heading. The game actually actively tracks that while you're moving around and playing in the game. And the reason it does that is because when you are significantly off the path, the passage of time flows quicker. And once you're in the dark, it gets quite dangerous. And after a very, very, very minimal time, uh, I think I have it at 30 seconds uh, of being completely in the dark, things end up going quite badly. Uh, and here again, from an asset limit point of view, I didn't have any you know, capacity for, and there we go, player has died. Uh, so I didn't have capacity for having uh, you know, an actual monster there. And I think things can be scarier when you don't have the monster. But let's take a look at starting off with sort of the anatomy of the scene of how this actually all runs together. So I mentioned that path. And we can actually see here is all of the markers for the path. So this worked out really quite nicely. So I think the, yep. So the main path is there on a scriptable object. And it just has a whole bunch of these markers. Uh, so this experience director is controlling and coordinating everything. Uh, and so what it would be doing, if we go and take a look, this one was handling if we were off the path. So if we were off the path, and the way that it would do that is periodically it would check to see uh, where the closest marker was. Once it got the closest marker, it figured out where we were in 2D space. So once it had the 2D distance, it looked at how far away you were with respect to this off path threshold, uh, which I've got as 50 meters and the world's fairly large. So if you were more than 50 meters off, the audio system would know. Uh, and it would also be able to send what that ratio was. So essentially how far off path you were. Uh, and that went to this timekeeper. So this is the timekeeper. So what it was handling was it would get this ratio and decide whether we were on or off path. And if we were on path, 
then that get would get fed through to this advancing of the time. It was a little bit sort of involved here. I don't really like that. I think this was an unnecessary use of scriptable objects. So I had daytime and nighttime segments here. So in daytime, I had the duration of it, which if we compare it to night, daytime was a shorter period. And if you were on the path, time or within 50 meters of it, time moved as normal. Uh, if you were off the path, time moved 25% faster. But at night, and this was intentional because nighttime is when you are actually in danger. Nighttime, if you went off path, it actually slowed down the passage of time. And so what it meant is that the longer you were off the path, the more danger you were in. So there was a couple of interfaces to feed into the Sky Manager stuff. Uh, and there was also this control for if it had a, the, the death clock. So one of the things with the Timekeeper was this death clock status changed, which that would get invoked for a couple of reasons. And again, I really, uh, this needlessly complicated it. So there was a lot of logic on the scriptable object that didn't really serve a good purpose. So what this would do is if we'd reached the end of the time period, it would reset and, uh, wow, I debug logged it <laughs> and left that in the ship version. Uh, so it would always return true if it reached the end of a particular one, which if we take a look, that would update whether a death clock is active. So that would then go and talk to, you can see this light globe inventory. So the light globe inventory is actually the thing that manages our death clock. So it handles the ticking, uh, it's stopping and running out. It handles it being 30 seconds. And so if we look at this, that's going to determine uh, what the count dead is. So if the death clock gets enabled, then it can go and actually start the countdown. So you have to be without any light. Uh, so no active globe, and then the clock will start. So during the daytime, you're completely safe. At night, you're very not safe. Uh, I was using the old input system, uh, and so this this worked. Like it did play, you know, play sounds. It kept track of things, but in terms of from an architecture point of view, having it that the you know this isn't even the light globe itself. This is the light globe inventory is keeping track of how close you are to death. Uh, it worked for being able to get things up and running quickly, which I didn't need for the project because it was obviously a lot of time on the environmental and audio side. But it did mean that from an architecture point of view, there's some really messy, super tight coupling happening uh, across the board, across a lot of different systems, which is not good. Uh, and there was a lot of stuff that sat on the first person controller that probably shouldn't have sat on there. All of this stuff for the light globe and handling a lot of things just shouldn't have actually done that. Uh, the path script, I did have a setup for being able to do the recording. So I'll make sure that script is available as well. So that, uh, cause that's why we can turn on and off the debug and you can just start at recording, really handy. So, and you could pause, resume, all of that sort of stuff. So I will actually make that script available as well. Uh, but so, yeah, once you were in the darkness, so if it was night and you had no light globe active, you were 30 seconds away from death, essentially. Uh, and that was very intentional. And if you activate a light globe, you were fine. So you needed to, it encouraged sort of being, very, very sort of sparing with using the lights. If you were over the top, then you would run out of light very quickly. Uh, if you didn't move through the world carefully, you could miss the light globes. But if you move through the world too carefully, you also might not be able to get to the next one in time. 
So it was possible to actually get to the end, but intentionally quite challenging. So audio I mentioned was a very big sort of part of this. And around the player, so I'll pause this so we can then see this. If we go over to where the player is, you can see around them all of these emitter objects. And if I grab all of these, I'm pretty sure I can still add a game object to all of those. Ready object, sphere. Uh, we'll turn off the collider and we'll make those really tiny. Of course, I went and only modified one of them. So let's modify all of these, do the same sort of thing. Like that. That's better. So there is this cloud of spheres centered around where the player is. So the player is here, and we have all of these spheres around them. Now, if I start it back playing, and now that I've added those, we can actually see there are multiple rings of these that move. Ooh, and they actually rotate with the player. Hindsight. That's definitely something I would change. That's something I didn't actually realize until now, but of course, with them being anchored, they would do that. Uh, that could be, that could result in some quite interesting effects. So these are used for where audio emits from. And at the moment, they're moving fairly slowly. But if I go way off the path intentionally, there and so that we uh, get into night time. What we'll notice is that they actually move a lot faster. And what I'll do is if I come back to this, I'm going to bring the game view down to here and we'll just unpause this so that. There we go. So now, if I go to the scene view and look at this, so they, we can see the normal behavior in the daytime is these sound sources move around the player and move at a relatively steady rate. They're not moving super rapidly. So this is where, you know, during the daytime, sounds like the you know, chirps from the birds, things like of that, will come through. Now, these also, these sounds, if we take a look at how those are actually organized, they're handled by this audio cloud, uh, which the audio cloud, I will include that as well. There might be some stuff in it that's WI specific that I have to comment out. Uh, so it might not be fully complete, but I'll try and leave those things commented out with a note. So this was, fully procedurally sort of created. It organized things into uh, layers and that they would spawn at a particular distance. And it had this variation between day and night. So in daytime, there was various sounds that could be played and there was a separate set at nighttime. And so nighttime had more ones that were from like the ground as in sort of at your ground level and above ground. Uh, and so it grouped these layers based upon where it decided they were relative for you, to you. Uh, so that was how it would sort of pick between different ones to play. And the idea was to give a good variation in where the sounds are coming from. Now, if we look at the configs here, when it goes over to night, we'll notice that these will start moving a lot faster because at night time, they actually rotate at three times the speed. That's again, an intentional thing. So there we go, there's the night mode, and you see this approach where they draw in and then pull back out, and then you'll see that pattern repeat. 
So this was a very intentional thing of I wanted the sound to really be ramping up the intensity. That nighttime experience, I wanted it to be as terrifying as possible from an audio point of view. So having during the daytime things stay at, you know, a fairly consistent distance and at daytime everything is staying about sort of 15 meters away from you. Uh, and it can vary a little bit. So three meters plus or minus it can vary, but it does that over a fairly slow period. It's very gradual, quite far away. So it's intended to be a chill, calming environment. Occasionally you might get ones interspersed that are a little bit more intense. Whereas nighttime is intended to be very intense, especially, uh, and this happens whether you're in the dark or not. So having the things move faster meant that if you were playing with something where you could easily distinguish sort of uh, the location, the position of a sound, you would notice it shift more rapidly. And having it pull inwards if you had one of the sounds trigger while it's doing that pulling inwards, that means you're going to feel the sound of like the sounds essentially rushing towards you and then rushing back away. So it was designed to really ramp up the intensity and in general to make people ideally as terrified as possible. Because uh, dark in this should be dangerous. It should feel scary. So I'll share this code as well. There's not a lot to it. Like a lot of it is some general maths for spawning of the things. Uh, and then there is just the update logic for uh, it sort of moving things around and when it's going to pick new sounds. And it would pick just randomly. Uh, but the higher the sort of intensity is at the moment, due to where you are, everything like of that, the more frequent it would actually be. So there is this little bit of a curve here that shows how the intensity should vary throughout sort of the night. So pretty rapidly climbs to a peak and it does have some oscillations, uh, but it gets pretty intense. Whereas daytime climbs to a peak again, it is overall less sort of intense. There's less variation there. Uh, so all of this was about trying to make it be terrifying. So day had a narrow range for when it could trigger between 0.5 and 2 seconds, uh, whereas nighttime it could trigger more frequently and also the upper limit on that was lower, so 0.1 to 1.5. So it could be playing sounds far, far, far more frequently. Again, intended to be kind of terrifying. That was sort of the goal with that aspect of it. Now, if we take a look and follow sort of along the path here, we it was intentionally a uh, one where the path was blocked so you couldn't easily just go directly over the terrain and this is one of the areas that from a design point of view these rocky sections did take a lot of iteration because getting a path clearly readable along those i think in hindsight i wish i'd actually made more use of the flowers I think the flowers there would have actually been really helpful for uh, marking out areas that are sort of safe or areas where the path continues. Uh, and the path tracking stuff, because of how it worked, could handle little side diversions like this. Because uh, there's little clearing, so right near the end, an uh, option where it can go, you know, you can take a wrong path down a clearing and I believe I did put a data pad there so that there was something that you could find and then if we keep wandering through you eventually when you get to the end of the path you 
find basically a stack of rocks and a final journal that essentially lets you know that all of the people and if you if you want to avoid spoilers then uh probably mute at this point until you see me give a thumbs up so mute now so for the spoiler version if you get here and you read the final data pad, what you end up finding out is that the entire team uh, has actually died. Uh, so that ends the spoiler section. So just in case anyone was muting it, all good to go. So we've got our path. And so this, this I found was one of the areas that I really like how it actually worked out. Doing this setup of marking out interesting locations. So the terrain environment was heavily generated using Gaia. Uh, so that, and I did a little bit of tweaking of some areas and obviously manually painting in that path. But I think as approaches go, it definitely worked. I don't think it would necessarily work in other games where you might need particular terrain or environmental features. But because I didn't, because I just kind of needed something that was a bit of a, a valley crisscrossed with, you know, some low, you know, mountain rangy hill type areas, I kind of could go largely with just a fully randomized environment. And then that meant the challenge with that was I picked out essentially interesting looking areas and put those markers out. And so that approach of, okay, well, there's an interesting thing over there. I'm going to head over that way. I tried to have that as be the draw card for how this worked. And it seemed to, you know, I think it worked out okay. Like the path feels more natural. It feels like one that a lot of people have traversed, uh, but you know, I think it and it did sort of come through okay because I cleared trees and grass as well it meant you had a few different things feeding in there but at night definitely super super challenging I think I'm okay with that but there's definitely things I would have liked to have done there in terms of having maybe some small flowers things like of that that have a little bit of illumination on them i think having little lights in the distance that are come that come and go maybe things that looked like sets of eyes i think that could have amplified the horror aspects as well uh, not having the audio cloud actually rotate with the player would have also been a handy addition there. I uh, didn't even realize until adding those debug spheres that that was what was happening. Uh, so that's something where I think avoiding that, because if you turned around rapidly, uh, you could get some interesting experiences there. I think it would still work okay, because it's still relative to where you are, and that's how the sound's going to be getting played. Uh, but I think... I would try and decouple those just to avoid potential sort of strangeness because the sounds should be oriented in the world, not oriented with respect to the player. So while it likely was never noticeable, there is a slight potential there that it could have been noticeable at times and might have lessened the effect. Uh, but it did end up working quite nice. I was quite happy with how it worked. So it was one where I did actually sort of start to split stuff out into separate menus but again none of this is actually still generic things this was uh, the sort of point where I was starting to get there and having a bit of a common base that I would bring into other projects at this stage I was just exporting a package uh, with things like the main menu a main scene a first person controller and bringing that into ones which is why there is a lot of stuff in this that I don't use it's why <laughs> why the repo has a dedicated junk folder uh, because there was a lot of things that I was doing there that really didn't end up working out uh, or that it just didn't sort of fit for it. So yeah, definitely needed some improvements there for it, but a lot of things in it worked out quite well. Uh, and you know, it very intentionally from a design point of view, I wanted this disconnect between this environment looks really happy and nice and chill and then that environment becoming very 
you know, overtly unfriendly and hostile. And I feel like that it did achieve that quite nicely. So there isn't a lot that I would change. There's things that I would obviously improve, like, you know, the code organization in this is awful. Uh, it's actually, <laughs> didn't realize how bad the code organization was until I was looking at it for this video. Uh, it's It has some of the worst code organization I've done, honestly. Um, having the inventory, keeping track of the active like lobe and being, and the inventory being the thing that's keeping track of how close to death you are and kicking off end game. That's, yeah. That was not a good setup for that, so I definitely would not do that again in future. And you know, I should have done a bit more planning, a bit more refactoring of stuff. This was one where I didn't do a lot of planning, had the idea, and I largely dived in and made it. So a little bit of planning could have made a lot of improvement there for it. But still a game that I ended up being really happy with how it worked out. So as I mentioned, I will make a bunch of the code for this project available. There will be a link to that in the description below. I'll also put a link to the game itself. Uh, the game is completely free, so and it's available for Windows and Mac. So that's one there that you can check out the game. And then you can also, if you want, check out the code. Uh, that code, it's not going to be the full project because there's obviously a lot of things like Gaia and WYs in this that I can't distribute the code for those. Uh, so it's just going to be selected sections of code, but that will be in a link in the description of the video, and you can use that code in any of your own projects. There's no restrictions or licenses there for that. Thanks, folks. Hope you found the video interesting and helpful. If you have, check in a like and subscribe. It really helps out. It's really appreciated. The links to the code and the game itself are in the description below. If you've got any questions, chuck those in a comment. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I also have a Patreon, and there is a link to that in the description as well. But until next time, bye.